Beyond Words, Advanced Communication for Today's Interpreter. Warren Buffett is one of the richest men in the world. A while back, he was speaking to a group of business students from Columbia University. He told them that he was willing to pay $100,000 for 10% of the future earnings of anyone present in the audience. $100,000. Okay, who of you watching this would take Buffett up on this offer? Raise your hands. He then went on to say he'd pay $150,000 for anyone with great communication skills. Now, if the richest man in the world puts that kind of price on public speaking, it must be super important. Since all of you watching this video want to be interpreters, professional communicators, you must be worth 10 times that amount. Okay, you're probably wondering, who is this guy? Let me introduce myself. Hi everyone, my name is Benjamin Nathan Sirio. I'm an actor by trade. Over the past 15 years, I've been in hundreds of improv shows and led more than 100 corporate training events on cross-cultural communication all over the world. So I know quite a bit about public speaking. Today I'm going to be sharing some of the secrets that make for an effective communicator and how being one of those will make you a better interpreter. This is the golden rule. To be a successful interpreter, you need to be able to speak effectively in public. Of course, public speaking and interpreting are different things, but they go hand in hand. And to be a good interpreter, you need to understand what's going on when your speaker speaks. You need to know why they're communicating the way they do, and how that impacts on your role as an interpreter. The good news is that the principles behind effective communication are really straightforward, and if you can apply some of them, or maybe all of them, when you're putting a translated message across to an audience, you'll stand out from your interpreter colleagues as a top-notch communicator. Here's a simple model that was developed by two colleagues of mine, one from Dartmouth, the other from Columbia. It encapsulates everything that goes into developing a strategy for effective communication. Getting to grips with it will help ensure that the dialogue between your speaker and their audience run as easily and effectively as possible. So what do I, the public speaker, need to ask myself? Who is my audience? Who am I actually speaking to? What is my goal or intent in this act of communication? And how do I turn my intent into a message? Now these three questions add up to AIM. Aim, audience, intent, and message. If you can get your aim right, you'll hit your target. First of all, audience. I need to analyze and understand their culture and needs before I even start to try to get my message across. The most important aspect of any communication strategy is having a good understanding of the audience, who they are, what are they interested in, what's the best way to get them listening. In short, you need to understand their culture and their agenda. If you give a speech that isn't relevant to them, it'll have zero impact. Whenever I'm preparing for a job, I exchange a lot of emails and talk as much as possible with my client, I need to understand exactly what the client's thinking, because only then can I know what they want. And when I know what they want, I can deliver the right training program for them. 
with an audience, a one-size-fit-all approach to communication it simply doesn't work. When a tailor is making a suit, he doesn't just dream it up out of thin air. He takes a good look at his client, measures him, analyzes his posture, maybe even the way that he stands and sits, and the client gives instructions on what he wants from his suit. Once all of this preliminary research is done, only then does this tailor start making the suit. Otherwise, it'll never fit. Okay, let's use as an example the following. The most important people at this session today are you, the viewers. It's easy to make the mistake of thinking that the speaker is the most important person in the room. In fact, your audience needs are more important than yours. Never forget that. Now, I'd like to ask you, the audience, for some help. When you're done watching this video, I'd love to hear from you. What aspects of Western communication would you like to know more about? Drop me an email. I'll make up a list of your questions and try to answer them in future videos. So now, I know who my audience is. I need to be clear on what it is that I want to achieve, my objective. I'll be using intent, goal, and objective interchangeably today, as they mean pretty much the same thing. All too often, speakers don't have a clear intent. They don't speak to achieve an objective, but rather to fill a time slot. What a wasted opportunity, right? Once I've covered my audience and my aim, I can go on to create my message, figure out what I'm going to say, how I'm going to say it, how long it will be, and so on. That's aim in a nutshell. Now I'll go over the aim structure, but in more detail, starting with the audience. First of all, research your audience. Ask yourself these three questions. Who are they? What do they do? What will they be thinking? What they're thinking gives you a solid base for understanding how they'll interpret your interpretations. Once you can start seeing things from your audience's perspective, you'll be better able to influence and persuade them. Let's go back to our tailor analogy. Imagine you have two tailors, both making a suit for the same client. One gets to meet the client, measure him, and discuss what he wants. The second tailor doesn't even get to meet his client. He has to make the suit up and hope for the best. Which suit do you think will fit the best? Well, the same principle applies to public speaking. So, now, I've explained why it's important to know your audience. I'll try to demonstrate all this by putting my acting skills to use. I'm going to act out a speech and then analyze it. As you watch, pay close attention to what I do to engage the audience, to attract and hold their attention, and specifically meet their needs. Okay, here's scene one. This is a talk about motivation. I need to make a confession at the outset here. A little over 20 years ago, I did something that I regret. Something that I'm not particularly proud of. Something that in many ways, I wish no one would ever know. But here, I feel kind of obliged to reveal. In the late 1980s, in a moment of youthful indiscretion, I went to law school. In America, law is a professional degree after you go to university. You go on to law school. When I got to law school, I didn't do very well, to put it mildly. I didn't do very well at all. In fact, I graduated in the part of my law school class that made the top 90% possible. I never practiced law a day in my life. I pretty much wasn't allowed to. 
But today, against my better judgment, against the advice of my own wife, I want to try to dust off some of those legal skills. What's left of those legal skills? I, I don't want to tell you a story. I want to make a case. I want to make a hard-headed, evidence-based, dare I say, lawyerly case for rethinking how we run our businesses. So, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, take a look at this. This is called the candle problem. It was created in 1945 by a psychologist named Carl Dunker. He created this experiment that is used in many other experiments in behavioral science. And here's how it works. Suppose I'm the experimenter. I bring you into a room. I give you a candle, some thumbtacks, and some matches. And I say to you, your job is to attach the candle to the wall so the wax doesn't drip onto the table. Now, what would you do? Many people begin trying to thumbtack the candle to the wall. Doesn't work. I saw somebody kind of make the motion over here. Some people have a great idea where they light the match, melt the side of the candle, try to adhere it to the wall. It's an awesome idea. Doesn't work. And eventually, after five or ten minutes, most people figure out the solution, which you can see here. The key is to overcome what's called functional fixedness. You look at that box and you see it only as a receptacle for the tax, but it can also have this other function as a platform for the candle, the candle problem. I want to tell you about an experiment using the candle problem done by a scientist named Sam Glucksberg, who is now at Princeton University. This shows the power of incentives. He gathered participants and said, I'm going to time how quickly you can solve this problem. To one group, he said, I'm going to time you to establish norms, averages for how long it typically takes someone to solve this sort of problem. To the second group, he offered rewards. He said, if you're in the top 25% of the fastest times, you get $5. If you're in the fastest of everyone we're testing here today, you get $20. Now, this is several years ago. Adjusting for inflation, it's a decent sum of money for a few minutes of work. It's a nice motivator. Question. How much faster did the group solve the problem? Answer. It took them, on average, three and a half minutes longer. Three and a half minutes longer. This makes no sense, right? I mean, I'm an American. I believe in free markets. That's not how it's supposed to work, right? <laughs> if you want people to perform better, you reward them, right? Bonuses, commissions, their own reality show. Incentivize them. That's how business works. But that's not happening here. You've got an incentive designed to sharpen thinking and accelerate creativity, and it does the opposite. It dulls thinking. It blocks creativity. What's interesting about this experiment is that it's not an aberration. This has been replicated over and over and over again for nearly 40 years. These contingent motivators. If you do this, then you get that work in some circumstances, but for a lot of tasks, they actually either don't work or often they do harm. This is one of our most robust findings in the social sciences and also one of the most ignored. I spent the last couple of years looking at the science of human motivation, particularly the dynamics of extrinsic motivators and intrinsic motivators, and I'm telling you, it's not even close. If you look at the science, there's a mismatch between what science knows and what business does. What's alarming here is our business operating system. 
Think of the set of assumptions and protocols beneath our businesses, how we motivate people, how we apply our human resources. It's built entirely around these extrinsic motivators, around carrots and sticks. So that's actually fine for many 20th century tasks, but for 21st century tasks, it's mechanistic. It's a reward and punishment approach that does not work and often does harm. Let me show you. Glucksberg did another similar experiment. He presented the problem in a slightly different way, like this up here. Attach the candle to the wall so it doesn't drip onto the table. Same deal. We're timing for norms. We're incentivizing. What happened this time? This time, the incentivized group kicked the other group's butt. Why? Because when the tax are out of the box, it's pretty easy, isn't it? <laughs> Rewards work really well for those sorts of tasks. The reasons they worked is that they incentivize us to focus and concentrate. So for tasks like this, a narrow focus where you just see the goal right there, zoom straight ahead to it, they work really well. But for the real candle problem, you don't want to be looking like this. The solution is on the periphery. You want to be looking around. That reward actually narrows our focus and restricts our possibility. Let me tell you why this is so important. So, I used a personal story. Personal stories or anecdotes are a great way for a public speaker to get an audience to relate to him or her as an individual. That reliability then makes you seem trustworthy and gives the audience more of a reason to carry on listening. Also, poking fun at myself, especially about how poor I performed in law school, was bound to go down well. We call that self-deprecating humor. It lets you get closer to your audience. You put yourself on their level, rather than setting yourself up as a great authority figure. This technique of creating a credible character for yourself is known in rhetoric as ethos. Anything else you saw that helped me connect with the audience? Well, one very simple strategy I used was eye contact. By looking out at the audience, you can physically connect with them. This too makes you seem more reliable and trustworthy. Also, very important, I didn't stand behind a podium, read from a script, or keep turning around to look at my own slides. I kept my eyes on the audience at all times, meaning you are all important to me. That kind of thing is equally important for interpreters who often have to convey complex messages that require a lot of attention from the audience. Knowing how to keep your audience engaged will make you a stronger interpreter. Okay, so what about the content? How about the candle problem? Did you figure it out? That was another thing that I did to engage the audience. I gave them a puzzle something to get them curious and create suspense. People want to know where you're going with this, so they listen harder. It's quite a simple trick. The big thing to remember is, if you want to inspire and influence your audience, first of all, get to know them, get on their side, get their attention, and keep it. So, we've spoken about the audience part of AIM, AIM. What about intent? Essentially, what change do I want to come about from this speech? Once you know what you want to achieve, you can start figuring out how to communicate it. The clearer your objective, the easier it is to achieve it. An objective can be simple. Sometimes it's just to get the audience to like you, or the organization you represent. Sometimes it's to get them to invest, or to vote, buy a product, or rally to a cause. All speeches have an objective. When you've identified it, you can work towards achieving it. Another thing, the more measurable my objective is, 
the easier it will be to gauge whether or not I've succeeded. For example, if I want you all to apply for a job with me, I can measure my effectiveness simply by the number of applications and resumes I get after the presentation. No, I'm not currently recruiting. Similarly, if my intent is to sell a product, I can see how much sales have increased by after my speech. Here's another little analogy. If I'm going to give a party, I need to guesstimate how many people there will be there, uh, how much food and drink and anything else I'll need to buy. Uh, depending on the type of party, I need to work out how many people will pass out on the sofa. It's the same with communication. You need to plan what you want. Of course, all this applies to all acts of communication, whether you're talking to one friend or 100 strangers, whether you're on the bus or in an interpreting booth. In one-on-one -on -one conversation, it's a lot clearer to analyze your audience, especially if it's someone you know, you have a shared history with, you, you know what motivates them, and so on. Here are just five examples of the kinds of intent a presentation might have. Of course, there are a lot more than this out there. Win a negotiation, reconnect with employees, realize a vision, share memorable information, persuade potential investors to, well, invest. So there you have parts one and two. Analyze and get to know your audience and clarify your intent. Obviously, there are as many audiences and intents as there are speeches delivered, just as there are an infinity of suits waiting to be made. Which brings us to the final part of the AIM strategy. Create a message that's understandable and memorable. For this part, I'll be relying on a book called Made to Stick by a father and son team, Dan and Chip Heath. Chip's a colleague of mine here at Stanford. First of all, I'll give you their framework for creating messages that stick. Then, I'll be acting out another scene to illustrate a message that really sticks. The Heaths identify six key elements. My first consideration when creating a message is this. Keep it simple enough for people to understand. When I'm coaching corporate executives, they often say to me, so you want me to dumb it down, right? That's not what I mean. Rather, I want them to keep the core of their message clear enough for anyone in the audience to grasp and act on. The key to effective communication is the mastering of the art of simplification without descending into simple-mindedness. Remember Warren Buffett from the start of my presentation, the American billionaire who offered $150,000 for great communicators? He tells people he won't invest in any business idea he can't understand in three minutes or less. The challenge for you as interpreters is how to keep the message simple and clear without losing any of the nuance and detail of the original. Next, do something unexpected. If I can catch people off guard, even for a moment, they'll be more engaged and more inclined to listen to me. Obviously, I don't have to start tap dancing or talking in Klingon. A single word or phrase can do the trick. You, the interpreter, should strive to convey the unexpectedness, but without causing actual heart failure. Now, I need to make my message, make sure that my message is concrete, and if I'm to stand any chance of winning and persuading the audience to do this, I might use an example or analogies that people can understand and relate to, things from everyday life that everyone has experience of. I guess it goes without saying that the information I share with the audience has to be credible. If I have evidence or statistics to back it up, I should use it to aid my credibility. If appropriate, it is also good to include emotional messages that touch the heart and minds of the audience. This is called pathos. This is particularly important if I'm trying to engage employees or persuade investors that they 
understand my passion for what it is that we are trying to accomplish. If it feels appropriate, I might like to use some kind of emotional message to touch the hearts and minds of the audience. In rhetoric, this is known as pathos. Pathos is particularly useful if I'm trying to connect with employees or persuade potential investors. I need to get across to them the passion I feel for what I'm trying to accomplish. And lastly, everyone loves a story. If I can work one in, like I did earlier in scene one, the audience will be more engaged with the rest of my content. Now, you've probably all been wondering who the guy with the enormous pants is. Well, his name is Jared. Everyone in America knows who Jared is. In fact, if I just mentioned the name Jared, everyone in America would say, yeah, I know Jared. Jared, as you might have guessed already, is a man who lost a lot of weight. He started exercising, putting himself on a diet, and lost 185 of his 400 pounds over a period of 15 or 16 months. I weigh just under 185 pounds, so he lost more or less a whole me. Wow, that must be a great diet. Guess what he ate? He ate nothing but Subway sandwiches. That's right, nothing but Subway sandwiches. Lunch and dinner over a year. Subway liked his story. They liked it so much that they made him the spokesperson for the company. They often use this photo in their commercials to illustrate his weight loss. Okay, why am I telling you this? Because the Jared story contains all six of those elements we've just been talking about. It's simple. Man loses weight, becomes household name, 30 seconds work. It contains the unexpected. He really lost all that weight eating fast food? It's concrete. Look, here's the photo to prove it. And it's riddled with credibility. He's a real guy. Subway didn't hire him until after he'd lost that weight. It had emotion. A lot of Americans struggle to lose weight. And we love winners. And the whole thing makes a great story. Okay, let's move on to scene two. I'll be reenacting part of a speech by someone that you all ought to know, that master of communication, Steve Jobs. We're going back in time to 2005, before the iPad, before even the iPhone, practically prehistory. Way back then, there was just Apple computers and the iPod. Steve Jobs gave this speech to launch the latest line in the iPod series. As you watch, pay attention to the message and look out for those six success elements. Today, we're going to focus on the iPad mini. Now, the iPad mini is what all our competitors have their sights focused on. Why? Because it's obvious, the iPod mini is the most popular music player in the world. It's the most popular iPod, and that makes it the most popular music player in the world. So that's the one that everybody's focused on. Well, today, we're going to do something pretty bold. We're going to replace it. We're going to replace it with something new. Now, let's go back to the beginning because we started this all with a thousand songs in your pocket, right? We started it with the original iPod. Then we carried the original 1,000 songs over to your iPod mini. Now, we're going to replace the iPod mini with a new player, with an entirely ground up, brand new design that also has a thousand songs in your pocket and it's called the iPod Nano. The iPod Nano is the biggest revolution since the original iPod. A lot of people worked hard on this over the last many, many months, and it is my privilege to show it to you now. The thousand songs in your pocket, the iPod Nano. I've got a pocket right here, and this one has been the one that your iPod goes in. 
Traditionally, the iPod and the iPod Mini fit great in there. Okay, before I go on with my acting, I just want to ask you if you know exactly what's going to happen next. Has anyone ever wondered what this pocket is for? I've always wondered that. Well, now we know, because this is the new iPod Nano. Which elements did you spot? Well, it's simple. I'm here to introduce the iPad Nano. Concrete. And here it is. Look, unexpected. Did you guess right that he'd just take one out of his pocket like a magician, pulling a rabbit out of a hat? And that it would be so small. If I'd done the rest of the speech, I'm sure that the other three elements would have turned up eventually. Okay, let's summarize what we've learned so far. First and foremost, have a communication strategy. Next, know your audience. Find out what's important to them. Be clear as to what you want and what you want them to do. And craft a message that's memorable and compelling enough to have them do it. I should add and stress here that everything you've learned so far today applies as much to written as spoken communication. If you're writing an email to one individual, submitting a business plan to a committee of 12, or creating a report that will be read by 12,000, you still need an AIM strategy. Remember, audience, intent, message. In this next part, though, we'll be concentrating on oral communication, whether to a handful, a room full of people, Oral communication is all about delivering information through the medium of speech. I'm going to give you some very specific examples of how Western speakers connect with Western audiences. It's your task to assess how different they are from the ones Chinese speakers use with Chinese audiences and figure out which bits of them work for you in terms of your audience, intent, and message. On a general note, Westerners are more direct when it comes to communication. Another big thing is that we tend to be more theatrical. Maybe not as theatrical as me, but then again, I'm an actor. Now then, there are three aspects to all spoken communication. There are Three aspects to what I'm saying right now. The verbal aspect is the actual words I'm using. The vocal aspect is how I'm using my voice. I can get louder or softer. I can speed up or I can slow down. I can leave silences. I can get really excited and so on and so on and so on. And then there's the visual aspect. That's how I use my body. Shall I stand over here or stand over here? And it's how I use my eyes to engage with the audience. And it's hand gestures as well. Hand gestures say a lot about what you're trying to say. Question, which of the three do you think most influences an audience? Some of you might think the visual's the most important and powerful because it gives that first impression. The minute I walked onto your screen today, you started forming an impression of me as a speaker. Before I'd said a word, you had a visual reading on me and began to make a judgment. But might it be the vocal or verbal aspect? If you close your eyes, the visual image of me disappears, but you still get my voice, unless you've fallen asleep, that is. Maybe you think my actual words are the most powerful stuff you've ever heard. Two peanuts were walking down the street. One was assaulted. I'd like to demonstrate to you the power of visual communication. For this exercise, I want you to do exactly as I tell you. Ready? Yeah? First, form a circle with your thumb 
and forefinger, like this, with your hands. Now, take this circle and press it against your cheek. That's it. Press it. Press it against your cheek, like I'm doing. Okay. You can stop pressing now. Did you do what I did and press the circle against your chin? Don't worry if you did. It's not just you. In training seminars I've done in the past where everyone's been a native speaker, even they do it. Visual impact is much stronger than words. Of course, this isn't to say that the other two aspects don't matter. It's just to show you that the visual aspects can actually override what we say and how we say it. As interpreters, you must know this already. If you're in consecutive mode, you can't sit staring at your notes for the duration of the speech, and in simultaneous mode, you can't keep your eyes fixed on the microphone in front of you. There's a reason for the interpreting box having a glass window facing the podium. You have to glance at the speaker from time to time to be sure that you're not missing out on any of the visual information he or she is putting across. Great. Now let's take a look at all three of these aspects in terms of public speaking and the public speaker standing in front of a room delivering information person to person. We'll start with the verbal. Now, all three aspects are part of my communicator's toolkit, but it's the words I choose and how I craft them into a message that need the most care and attention. First of all, I need to get the tone right. In both scenes, I was very clear in the first words that came out of my mouth, setting the tone. For the rest of the speech, I need to choose my first words very carefully because they'll be the audience's first impression of me. They're the starting point for all the communication that will follow. Do you remember the exact first words I said 45 minutes ago? I talked about the importance of good communication skills by using Warren Buffett as an example. For another audience, I might have started with something different, but I always take the time deciding how I'm going to begin. It's only very rarely that I start with, Hi, my name is Ben, which isn't very compelling, especially if no one's introduced me. I may still need to get my name out there, but I can do it a sentence or two later, as I did today. It also keeps the focus on the audience rather than on the speaker. Another thing, did, did you notice how in scene two I said, a thousand songs in your pocket? over and over again. It's a short, simple phrase, but because I repeated it several times, you remembered it. So repetition's another thing to consider when creating our message. Now, for the vocal aspect. How we use our voices to project to the audience. Do you know what I most often hear my clients complain about on the subject of interpreters? They're not loud enough. I hear this far more often than anything about the faithfulness of their translation. It's the same for public speakers. When I'm in a room full of people fidgeting and coughing and playing angry birds with the sound on, I need to use my voice effectively to be sure that the people at the back can hear what I'm saying. To do this, we need to breathe. In my case, I'm very much trying to breathe from my diaphragm and not from my throat, so that I'm pushing the breath out. And of course, I take regular sips of water, so I'm not straining my voice. This is even more important for you interpreters who might be talking six hours a day. We all need to take care of our voices. It's a precious instrument. I can judge how I'm doing with volume and other vocal elements, pace and clarity, by recording myself in action. Nearly all of us have a gadget we can use to record audio or video. Be careful. 
If you're recording yourself on an interpreting assignment, you'll need to ask permission to do that from your client. But record yourself as much as you can, preferably with some kind of audience. Ask a friend or a colleague to help you out with the camera work if needed. It's the best way of assessing how you're performing vocally. One big thing to look out for in your recordings is your use of fillers, non-words like um, uh, er. These actually prevent us com from communicating our ideas effectively. If I sound like I'm not sure what I'm saying, well, I might come across as someone who doesn't know what they're saying. Another thing public speakers in particular can pick up on by watching their own performance is verbal tics. Adding things like, actually, you know, like, uh, these aren't so bad in conversation, but hearing them from a public speaker on a stage, well, they're not great. So that's the verbal and vocal. Knowing our habits and perfecting our skills will make our speech more fluent, more coherent, and yes, more interesting. Now for the biggie. The visual. This is so important. Remember that 55%? That I'll be going into a bit more in detail with each of these items you see here. Let's start with eye contact. Here in the West, students of public speaking have sustained eye contact with individuals in the room for between three and seven seconds. The strategy is called one person, one thought. I deliver one complete thought to one person. I connect with them for the duration of that thought. Then I move on to someone else for the next thought and connect with them and so on. I want to avoid scanning the whole audience and never connecting with anyone or, and this is common among my Asian counterparts, putting all of my attention on the most important person in the room, connecting with him alone and ignoring the rest of the room. On interpreting assignments, you'll very likely have a senior leader in the room, a chairman or a dignitary or some other VIP. Yes. Give them proper attention, but give it to everyone else in the room as well. They're all your audience. Now, when it comes to stance, I obviously want to be comfortable in front of the audience, so I keep my stance simple, just like I'm doing right now. Let's break this stance down a bit. First of all, my toes are pointed towards the back of the room. What that does is square my body off with the room so that my full attention's focused on you, the audience. If I move a little bit, my toes point somewhere else. So I make sure I stop to face the back of the room again. I'm keeping my energy focused. I also want to keep my weight evenly distributed between both legs. I don't want to lean to one side or the other because that will make me look less powerful. So I keep my weight evenly distributed with my feet about the width of my shoulders apart, make full gestures. I bring one or both hands up from my sides. If I want to emphasize an important point or if I want to dwell on this or that idea, then when I gesture, I make full gestures. I bring one or both hands up from my side. If I want to emphasize an important point, or if I want to dwell on this or that idea, then when I'm done with the gesture, my hand goes back to my side, not to my waist. This uh, will make you risk keeping your hands here at your waist the whole time, and you might start to look a little bit like a T-Rex. So. Keep them at your sides. If I'm going to refer to the audience to a slide, I feel it's best to use my whole body as a pointer. When I do use my hands, it's the one closest to the screen, not crossing over like this, but reaching up like this. Keeping my body as open to the audience as possible. You'll also notice that as I speak, I move around a lot. 
That's partially to keep my nerves down, but it's also to make sure that my audience keeps their eyes on me. Every time I move, you pay more attention. The important rule for movement when speaking to a group of people is that you move on transitions. Deliver all the important information when you're standing still. When you change subject, you move. As an interpreter, you might have to follow a speaker around the room while he's demonstrating various bits of equipment. It's important that you start interpreting when he's not moving, so that the audience doesn't wind up having to follow his movements and your words at the same time. The last thing I need to think about in the space is the amount, the distance between myself and the audience. You'll notice that from time to time, I come pretty close to the audience and linger a while. This allows me to connect with the people in the back rows, but I can't linger there too long because that would mean forcing the front rows to turn around or worse, disengage altogether. Of course, I need to be culturally sensitive to the distance between myself and the people I'm speaking to. In a presentation to the public, this is probably as close as I should get. If I get any closer, I'm starting to invade your personal space. Also, this is too, too close a space to get in an individual when I'm supposed to be addressing the whole audience. Obviously, if I'm in a one-on-one -on -one negotiation with someone, this kind of distance might be completely appropriate. Now, as interpreters, you might sometimes find yourself in a situation where you're not standing at all. You might be sitting in a conference room with two or three other seated people. When that happens, you need to follow the same rules I mentioned. Always face the person you're speaking to. Point your toes toward him or her. Maintain the same posture as if you were standing and keeping your body slightly towards the edge of your chair. Feet together. And don't cross your legs. If you lean back in your chair while you're uh, speaking, that will actually create a distance between you and your audience, and you don't want that. You need to show them that you're engaged and focused on that person. And if there's a conference table, keep your hands visible above the table as you're speaking. So those are the essentials of visual communication. Eye contact, stance, gestures, movement, the space between the speaker and the audience. Of course, all of this has to be adapted to the audience I'm speaking to and what's appropriate for them and for me. The last thing I want to talk to you about today is how to tell stories effectively in a business setting. As we've already seen, stories are a great way of connecting with the audience. In a moment, I'll show you an example of a presenter telling an effective story. But before that, there are four tips for telling a good story. The first tip, this may sound a bit weird at first, is start in the middle. Don't give a great long preamble, just right into the story and grab the audience's attention. They'll catch up to you. As well as this, you need to choose your first words very carefully. One story that I often tell starts like this. It was the presenter's worst nightmare. I showed up 15 minutes before I was due to start and the technology in the room wouldn't work. So I don't start with, I'm about to tell you a story. I just parachute into the middle of the story, setting the scene in five seconds flat. It's not only a more efficient way of telling a story, audiences find it interesting. Okay, tip number two. When you're storytelling, use the one person, one thought idea. We mentioned earlier, if you just glance briefly at multiple people while you're going through an idea, the audience will think you've just got the jitters, which won't instill them with confidence in you. My third tip is learn to be comfortable with silence. Silence allows an audience time to reflect on what the speaker has said. Silence can even get an audience to start paying more attention. Dramatic pauses create suspense. Okay, 
Tip number four is remember the magic grain truck. Remember what, I hear you say? Well, to explain what I mean, I need to tell you a story. When I was a high school student, 14 years old, in English class, our English teacher, Mr. Wesling, gave us this example to make us understand the power of poetry. I lived with my parents in the countryside of New York State. Almost all of us lived or worked on farms. So it was easy for us to understand. He said this, okay kids, you're harvesting grain in June and you have to get the grain from the farm to the city to sell it. What would happen if your truck could carry seven times the normal amount of wheat? Well, we all looked at each other and said, that's impossible. You can't get seven truckloads of wheat in one truck. But Mr. Wesland persisted, yes, but what if, what if you could do it? So we had to come up with a solution to the puzzle. Maybe if we used less gas, maybe if we squashed the grain into little tin cans, maybe if, well, he had us stumped, I can tell you. The solution? Simple. Get a magic truck, he said. And that's what poetry is. In poetry, if you're doing it right, you can make one or two words carry the same amount of meaning usually contained in 14 or 15. Today, I've given you two examples of a kind of poetry. So, this is my fourth and last recommendation for good storytelling. Aim for success. Those two mnemonics contain pretty much all you need to know. If you've forgotten already what they stand for, look at your notes. What do you mean you're not taking any notes? You're an interpreter. Now, I'll show you some of all of this in practice in my final scene for today. As you watch, pay attention to how I'm telling the story. People do stupid things. That's what spreads HIV. This was a headline in a UK newspaper, The Guardian, not that long ago. I'm curious, show of hands, who agrees with it? Well, one or two brave souls. This is actually a direct quote from an epidemiologist who's been in the field of HIV for 15 years, worked on four continents, and you're looking at her. And I'm now going to argue that this is only half true. People do get HIV because they do stupid things, but most of them are doing stupid things for perfectly rational reasons. Now, rational is the dominant paradigm in public health. And if you put your public health nerd glasses on, you'll see that if we give people the information that they need about what's good for them and what's bad for them, if you give them the services that they can use to act on that information, and a little bit of motivation, people will make rational decisions and live long and healthy lives. Wonderful. That's slightly problematic for me. Because I work in HIV. And although I'm sure you all know that HIV is about poverty and gender inequality, actually, HIV is about sex and drugs. And if there are two things that make human beings a little bit irrational, they are erections and addiction. So, let's start with what's rational for an addict. Now, I remember speaking to an Indonesian friend of mine, Frankie. We were having lunch and he was telling me about when he was in jail in Bali for a drug injection. It was someone's birthday, and they had very kindly smuggled some heroin into jail, and he was very generously sharing it out with all of his colleagues. And so everyone lined up, all the smackheads in a row, and the guy whose birthday it was filled up the fit, and he went down and started injecting people. So injections, 
the first guy, and then he's wiping the needle and on his shirt, and he injects the second guy, and Frankie says, hmm, I'm number 22 in line. And I can see that the needle's coming down towards me, and there's blood all over, and it's getting blunter and blunter, and the small part of my brain is thinking, that is gross and really dangerous. But most of my brain is thinking, please let there be smack left by the time it gets to me. Please let there be some left. And then, telling me this story, Frankie said, you know, God, drugs really make you do stupid things. And you know, you can't fault him either for accuracy. But actually, Frankie at the time was a heroin addict, and he was in jail. So his choice was either to accept that dirty needle or not to get high. And if there's one thing you really want to get in jail, it's high. Notice how I just told the story using only words and nonverbal communication. Now, here's one that uses quite a lot of numbers. But I'm a scientist, and I don't like to make data out of anecdotes. So let's look at some data. We talked to 600 drug addicts in three cities in Indonesia. And we said, well, do you know how you get HIV? Oh yeah, they said, by sharing needles. I mean, nearly 100% answered that. Yeah, by sharing needles. And do you know where you can get a clean needle at a price you can afford? to avoid that. And they said, oh yeah, 100%. We're smackheads. We know where to get a clean needle. So are you carrying a needle? We're actually interviewing people on the street, in the places where they're hanging out and taking drugs. Are you carrying a clean needle? One in four maximum. So no surprises then that the proportion that actually used clean needles every time they injected in the last week is just about 1 in 10. And the other 9 in 10 are sharing. Here, I wasn't just telling a story verbally, vocally, and emotionally so that you'd get involved in it. I used the visual aid of statistics up on the screen. But I didn't read it all off to you in one go, like a robot. Instead, I used stories and questions to break the numbers up into digestible portions. Nobody's born a great public speaker. It's a skill that's acquired with rigorous and systematic training over time. Nobody's born a great interpreter either, but you can train yourself to be a great communicator. Now, I know this is particularly challenging for people from Asian countries where public speaking isn't taught in school and there are very few opportunities to practice speaking in front of an audience. But I'll leave you with the basic framework you can use to get started. Have a strategy. Remember, audience, intent, message. And pay equal attention to the three V's, verbal, vocal, visual. If you have any questions or comments, please feel free to drop me a line. Thanks for your time and attention. I wish you all the very best of luck on your journey to becoming a great communicator. Until next time, see you.